Good morning and welcome. It's an exciting start to the Illumina Genomics Forum, both between yesterday and today. If all of you didn't just see the announcement from Francis, NovaSeq X, 20,000 genomes in a year at a cost of $200 a genome, both short read and long read uh, integrated into a single platform. Very exciting. And I'm really pleased to be here today with this esteemed uh, group of thought leaders. We are going to focus on genomic models in clinical practice today. The field of genomics is vast, and I think we often aggregate all of it and think about it as very future forward. Genomics is here. It is part of standard of care. There are many areas where it is medically indicated. We have medical management guidelines in place. We have reimbursement coverage. It should be integrated into clinical care in both a primary and specialty care setting. So today we're going to dive in a little bit further and learn about how all of you are implementing genomics in practice today. Carlo, I'm going to start with you. If you could share a little bit more about what you're doing at Providence. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, so, um, I mean, the guiding principles for us has been the genomics is the foundation of, of clinical care for quite a long time. We've been trying to bring that in clinical delivery over the last years. Um, where we, I think, do best is in the cancer uh, uh, arena. Um, there, um, uh, the foundation is uh, really driving the treatment of the patients, uh, so we uh, routinely do cancer testing in that setting. Uh, we have a model where actually we do that as part of our diagnostic workflow rather than the later point of stage, and we may talk about it a little bit later. Uh, so it really becomes a routine care for us. Um, and then on top of that, we try to cover the whole spectrum uh, of cancer. So prevention with uh, whole genome sequencing, um, early detection with things like Allure, with partnerships. Um, and also later on, the follow-up, right, and the response to therapies with MRD, medium residual disease, and technologies that cover the spectrum. We do this uh, with uh, uh, rollout internally with technology uh, that plays in, in, on our side, but also with partners. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we have an ecosystem built on top of that. So we have solutions that try to enable the consumption of all this work that I was mentioning before. And so we have things like the molecular tumor board solution, uh, which facilitates the consumption for the clinicians. We have machine learning, AI things, which uh, enable us to uh, match the patients to the proper clinical trials and so forth. And so, so it's not only the technology, but it's also an ecosystem around that, which is necessary to uh, really enable uh, the impact of this kind of approach. Now, you mentioned some things that are actually more future state, for example, prevention using yeah. genomic sequencing. So when you think about applying you know, in practice today and also looking at pushing and shaping the future, how do you delineate between that in terms of how you're actually integrating this into clinical care? Yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, the approach that we had was to go uh, deep first. Uh, so, so there are different ways to do this. Uh, one is to, you know, have population kind of basis and, and, and sequence everybody and try to show the outcomes results. We, our approach was really to focus on small groups and really go very deep on those. And that's the, the approach that we use for whole genome sequencing. Um, and, and there we really try to integrate uh, the whole genome sequencing in the clinical care delivery. And so we have solutions which actually go into the EMR, deliver the results in the EMR, uh, have connection points with the clinicians uh, have things like genome medical, uh, which help us actually to interact with the patients uh, uh, before and after the testing. Uh, so so the, the, the way we, we, we focused on this was the technology will come, the cost will decrease, as you heard today. Um, this is going to be widely available in the future. We really wanted to build a vertical, which will enable that kind of future state to roll out very quickly and rapidly. Right. Thank you. Lincoln, let's bring you into the conversation. I know you're the CEO of Culmination Bio, but you were also previously the Chief of Precision Health at uh, Intermountain. So if you would share with us a little bit more about what Intermountain specifically has. Well, you know, at Intermountain Healthcare, we built a precision medicine program that started really in 2013 when I joined Intermountain from the Bay Area. And um, in, in Palo Alto, I could do genomics for a patient here or there. Um, but the attraction to a place like Intermountain was that there were 33 hospitals, hundreds of physician clinics, and the opportunity was to implement precision medicine at scale. So I took the opportunity and we started initially in oncology. And we did, you know, what Carlo is doing and what everybody is now doing, I believe, which is somatic testing in advanced stages of mm -hmm. cancer to identify targeted treatment options. And you know, we found and published that uh, patients lived longer and it costs less to the health system. Intermountain has a payer side, so we could take advantage of that and do that economic analysis. So we had built our own internal lab to do all of this. And with that initial success in oncology, we said, where else should we point these laboratory capabilities? Where else within our clinical roll-up? And so 
we next went into behavioral medicine and started doing pharmacogenetics there. And then we went into the NICU and started doing rapid genomes for babies that are sick in the NICU uh, in, by partnering with Rady Children's, actually. They've, they've helped us. And then I started joking that we should just sequence everybody. And uh, after a while, I quit joking, and we ultimately, in, in agreement with our partners and friends at Decode Genetics, launched a population scale genome project where we've enrolled 150,000 people. We're doing whole genome sequencing in all of them. And um, all of that has transformed the health system. You know, precision medicine is happening on a daily basis there. We do um, uh, hundreds of pharmacogenetic tests a month. We do hundreds of uh, somatic tests a month. We enroll 6,000 people a month on our population scale genome project. So. It, and we're returning results to those patients. We're finding BRCA mutations and all the things that you've heard other systems do and people on this stage and in the audience are doing, you know, it's happening in real time. That's fantastic. And we are pushing the frontier, certainly, you know, both Providence and Intermountain in population genomics programs that are seeking to both advance research as well as clinical care and learn more about what is causative of disease and how we can you know, kind of further push forward in this era of genomics. That said, the average patient in a community setting, there are still huge care gaps in terms of standard of care in genomics and what should be accessible and equitably available to all patients. So James, I'd love to hear from you in kind of the community hospital setting and how are you able to apply these models in care? Right, thanks a lot. Um, so I've been at Morehouse School of Medicine uh, approaching 20 years. Uh, it's a freestanding medical school community-based, uh, meaning obviously we serve patients in our community, but it, uh, our clinical faculty also are in community clinics across the city, across the state. Um, so our first, one of our first forays into precision medicine has been uh, through the implementation of a, uh, one of the first of its kind um, precision cancer medicine implementation study called Total Cancer Care. Uh, we're part of the Orion, uh, or sorry, Oncology Research Information Exchange Network, uh, where that protocol was first developed. So we've been implementing that in a safety net hospital set setting, in a community oncology clinic setting. So, unlike my colleagues, you know, there, there's um, there there are some significant resource differences that you run into, different barriers that exist in the community oncology setting that we're trying to uh, mitigate. So in this protocol, at the, at the uh, time of consent, it's actually pretty straightforward. We're collecting germline DNA through a buckle swab or saliva. Um, we, we work with the pathology department to collect uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded sections, and off we go. Within a couple of weeks, we get a medical re report back to the patient and their provider, which never happened before, let's say, two years ago at some of the hospitals we're, we're, we're working with or the community oncology clinics. And how are you finding physicians able to embrace this new era and adopt genomics, especially? I, I must say, it's been somewhat of a mixed bag, to be quite honest. Um, we, we, we obviously, we have maybe a third are true champions, physician champions, we call them that can help make uh, acceptance of, of or activation in this, of the study uh, much more easy with uh, patients that become a participant. Mm -hmm. um, there are some that frankly need more education and uh, literacy associated with ge genomic medicine, mm -hmm. which we're also uh, addressing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess lastly, another barrier uh, you know, is part of their, making it part of their clinical workflow. Uh, so we had to add community health workers, community health navigators to uh, bring, bring these type of tests to their clinic. You know, Lisa, uh, James, what you said is so true. It really is a mixed bag. There are some physicians who immediately grasp it and can move forward and they want to implement it. And there are others who are sit around, sitting around saying, I need to see it from, you know, 12 national guidelines and all these yeah. KOLs and everything, and then maybe I'll think about it. And, you know, the common denominator amongst early adopters seems to be, like you said, those who uh, either are themselves a clinical champion or work directly with a clinical champion. And then the other big thing, it seems like, is if they have a good experience. So, 
Mm. You know, especially in oncology, when we saw oncologists sequence a patient, find an actual mutation, give them a targeted therapy, and the patient responded, yeah. they basically were then converted, and, and they, you know, then they always order it. So it's that combination of you know, good experience, a nearby clinical champion to give them confidence. And I agree, James, it's kind of a mixed bag. Well, I think that's part of the message of we're in the genomics era. So rather than stand on the sidelines, start to integrate these models into clinical care today. By way of uh, just a quick show of hands, how many clinicians or administrators at health systems do we have in the audience? If you would, please just raise your hand. Excellent. Great. It's helpful for me. So, uh, Christine, I'd love to hear, as more of an ecosystem player and on behalf of you know, molecular diagnostic labs, what are you seeing across the health systems and who's adopting today, and how are you helping to support this integration into clinical care? Yeah. I think one of the best examples I can think of is Christ Hospital Health Network, which is a community health system in Ohio. They are deploying similar programs in cancer care, cardiology. We, of course, support the testing, but I think that uh, the key is also the digital health tools. So in pharmacogenomics, we have integrated a clinical decision support tool directly into their Epic EHR that flags patients that have greater than 25% probability that pharmacogenetic testing will result in an immediate evidence-based drug or dose change guidance based on either CPIC or FDA. Mm -hmm. And when the testing is ordered, it triggers to an embedded ambulatory pharmacy team. They've invested to have seven ambulatory pharmacists in primary care, one in cardiology, one in oncology, one in the pain clinic. And they're really the experts that help the providers understand when to order and how to take this information into account across multiple different doctors that can be impacted when those results come back. We often see patients uh, with a pain medication, a cardiology medication, and a cancer medication that all need modification. Uh, and so they act on the results when they first come back, right in the EHR. And then they've been training the doctors. And because it's right in there, if the doctor goes to prescribe a new medication, they get a flag right there that says, hey, don't give that patient Plavix. They have a pharmacogenetic variation. They do a one-click alternative by class or indication. And as they are exposed to this clinical decision support tool, they start learning how impactful this information is. They get the aha moment that you just spoke of, Lincoln, where they're like, oh, this is really impacting the patients that I care about. Uh, we also have a tool called GIA, a HIPAA-compliant chatbot that helps uh, automate pre-test education, gather family history data, although we know we should be testing everybody regardless of family history now. It still uh, does align with reimbursement a lot of the time. So really leveraging not just the testing, but these tools that can make it easier to scale these. And what I'm really excited about is the community health setting. A lot of times, as Francis said the other day, it's the lucky or the rich. So mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to be by an academic medical center, you're probably getting access to these tools, but I'm, I'm incredibly excited about applying those in the community setting. And of course, 80% of patients are seen in the community setting, so we do need to bring it into mainstream medical care for everyone. So let's talk a little bit about the quadruple aim. How do we not only improve quality of care, but also improve cost of care, improve patient experience, and improve clinical decision making. Christine, I'll stay with you for a moment. I'd love to hone in on, because one of the, the big pushbacks at times is that this is going to cost more. So how would you respond to that? Yeah. So when I think about pharmacogenomics, it is a tool to optimize medications, right? In 2016, the last time it was measured, we spent $528 billion in the United States on non-optimized medications. That is more than we spent on the drugs themselves, more than we spent on any major chronic disease. And greater than 99% of patients have a pharmacogenetic variation that, on average, causes them to have an atypical response to 10 or more commonly prescribed medications. Um, studies I've personally been involved in, uh, one was in 65 and older polypharmacy patients. When we provided doctors with a personalized prescribing report that essentially, here's what the evidence says you should do to their current drug regimen to optimize it. They acted on the results about half the time in just four months. Uh, we saw a substantial reduction in both emergency room visits and hospitalizations. Uh, I believe 71% reduction in ER visits, 39% reduction in hospitalizations, saved 11.32 per patient prior to the cost of testing in just four months of follow-up. 
uh, did a follow-up study, and this, I really appreciated Jay's comments about pharmacist involvement the other day. Uh, this was a study that was done in a hospital that was already doing an exceptionally good job of reducing readmissions. Uh, one of the most common reasons patients end up back in the hospital, medication-related issues. So if they had a patient that was flagged as high risk of readmission, they actually had pharmacists visit them in the home to review their medications, talk to them about it. They were already in the top 10th percentile for lowest readmission rates in the country. Mm. So if patients were taking pharmacogenetic uh, impacted medications, we randomized them to treatment as usual, high touch pharmacy care, or those pharmacists were given access to pharmacogenetic testing and clinical decision support tools that looked at not just drug-drug, but also drug gene and multi-factor interactions. In 60 days, we saw 52% fewer readmissions, 42% fewer emergency room visits, not an endpoint of the study, but 85% fewer deaths, saving 4382 a patient in just two months. Yeah. That's fantastic. Let's have a round of applause on that. <laughs> we can save money. <laughs> Um, Lincoln, you mentioned earlier that uh, with genomics, we can at times detect cancer earlier. Yeah. Well, it's a fact that we can, when we find a stage one cancer, it's a 70% reduction in cost versus treating a late stage cancer. You've also been part of a number of studies that have started to demonstrate some of the health economic value. Can you share more about what you've learned? Yeah, you know, um Something that I've heard hospital administrators say, and also executives on the payer side say, you know, hospital administrators appropriately say, hey, we want to support things that will give better outcomes for patients. So we knew that was part of any evidence that we were going to generate was show outcomes for patients, right? And then what they say on the payer side appropriately is, we want to support two things on the payer side. We want to pay for things that um, are going to give better outcomes for patients. And the second thing they say is, will do what will follow physician practice. If physicians are ordering things, doing things, using tests, et cetera, you know, we'll, we'll follow that and support that. So when we implemented precision oncology, we said we better make sure we're measuring outcomes and let's do an economic you know, assessment as part of that. And so what we published was this improved survival, both in the progression-free and overall periods. And then we um, published that it costs less to the health system from an overall cost of healthcare standpoint, all healthcare costs included. So we took that back to the payer and gratefully, amazingly, and I, I'm actually still surprised by this, they changed their coverage policy to say, okay, now anybody with advanced cancer will pay for genomic profiling in them, you know, any, any stage three or four uh, cancer patients. So that was great news. And what surprised me more was that they sort of became attuned to this. And then the health plan at Intermountain changed the, their coverage policy to do the same thing for pharmacogenetics. They saw all this data that you and others were publishing, and they said, we will now cover pharmacogenetics for anyone with a new diagnosis of depression or anxiety. And so they uh, you know, were not only following the data, they were following physician practice, and they were you know, paying and covering for things that gave better outcomes. And you know, that's ultimately what led to the adoption most recently of these new multi-cancer early detection mm -hmm. tests. So that's actually now a thing that's available in that health system, at, at, at our health system at Intermountain. And so I think that's cool, and I know that's happening at other places as well, but I think those are the keys. If you can, if you can demonstrate that you get better outcomes for patients, or you can demonstrate demonstrate an economic improvement, or if you can demonstrate that physicians are using this and this is what the way their practice is going, um, that seems to resonate with stakeholders. James, would you yeah, have I, I, to I wanted to give everyone um, another example, uh, a real world example. I, I'm reminded by one of the cases uh, that came to us through our partnership with Invitae that's now part of, uh, sorry, Citizen that's now part of Invitae. Um, uh, I've, I've uh, received permission from uh, the participant in the study, James Connor, uh, diagnosed with a rare sarcoma. Uh, you know, a year or year and a half later, he survived a year-long bout of radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, at about a year and a half later, after surviving that, he enrolled in our total cancer care protocol. Uh, Come to find out, after receiving the medical report back, and he was treated, by the way, in a cancer center um, in Minnesota. Okay? Uh, as it turned out, um, the report came back with a non-lethal variant, 
uh, wasn't sarcoma, it was myoma, um, and probably could have done just as good on, with surgery as opposed to that uh, very toxic um, chemotherapy. Mm. So just imagine the costs that could have been saved there. And the patient impact. Exactly. Right? Yeah. exactly. Yeah, to, to echo Jim's point, uh, um, uh, I think the way we approach testing currently is we, we, we seek it when there is a treatment option, right, uh, for the patient. And often people go through chemo, surgery, and other things before that. That approach, I think, makes no sense to me. Uh, you know, cancer is a genetic disease, right? Uh, we, we say that with a lot of, uh, you know, with even not thinking about it twice. But yet, we don't do genetics on cancer all the time. We only do it when we seek the final treatment mm -hmm. alternative. To the often the commercial, the conventional approach, and 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 I think we are doing a disservice to our patients, which is very profound. You heard the story now of misdiagnosis, right? And so the role of early testing and incorporating a testing and diagnostics workflow is essential. Uh, it avoids those kind of scenarios. I can tell you, I see those every week, um, and and I have a great pathology team. Now, don't get me wrong, um, but I think we just missed the opportunity of integrating that kind of knowledge in our workflow. So we just look at a glass slide under the microscope and think that's it. You know, the genomes, who cares? Um, it's not going to work, right? Um, and unfortunately, the incentives are not really structured to bring this into the diagnostic workflow, but I think we have to. Um, and I, I think that will be even will become clearer with, with novel technologies. I think you have now long reads and other things. Uh, they will really make it evident that what we're currently doing is a disservice. It's such a good point. We often have more of a genomics as a last resort yep. as opposed to thinking genomics first. And you had mentioned a little earlier, Lincoln, even in a newborn setting, you know, two to three percent of all children born actually have a complication due to their genetics, and that can land them in the NICU. And we have strong evidence now that shows actually rapid exome or whole genome sequencing can get to a better diagnostic yield faster, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to embed the clinical decision support tools, the education, the access to specialists to enable us to move into a care setting model that adopts genomics first when and where necessary and relevant. So Carla, can you just share a little bit more on any kind of clinical decision support or educational support for physicians that you've enabled? And yeah, um, I, I mean, we, we unfortunately discovered early on that uh, um, we, you know, we would have actionable findings and uh, they were not always acted upon um, uh, because of lack of knowledge or, or, or lack of, you know, routine kind of mindsets which were leading physicians in a different direction, and, and so we, uh, the, we, 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 we attempted different models. So that the model that we feel is the most successful currently is that the idea of having a molecular tumor board, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, and that is an environment where you know, everybody who has to do with genomics, uh, you know, uh, including the folks who have an interest in pharmacogenomics, <laughs> are participating. Um, um, and uh, uh, so there's a whole team from that side, and then there are conventional actors like radiology, surgery, and uh, you know, oncology, and so forth, and pathology. Um, and I think we find that it is a very powerful tool. Now, I have to tell you that that is not enough, in my perception, because that uh, makes the, um, the, the genomics data available only in a, in a restricted setting. Uh, the tumor board, the genomics tumor board. And so what we're really aiming now is to, to make every tumor board a genomics tumor board. And so we have a technology platform that we try to extend to every subspecialty oncology uh, uh, clinical discussion. Um, and, uh, and basically we're using that as a Trojan horse to really push genomics into a kind of setting. And uh, so that, that work is ongoing right now. I, don't, I, I can't tell you exactly how it's going to proceed, um, but, uh, but, I, but I strongly believe that, uh, that that may be the opportunity for us to really embed genomics everywhere rather than, you know, in the elite kind of setting. <laughs> Well, and what's fantastic about that is you're using an educative moment at the point of patient care when it matters most, but when it's also then elevating clinician knowledge. And you bring that into a continuous pattern of adoption, and then it becomes pattern recognition yep. and much more you know, comfort and awareness and ability to further adopt. So I like that model a lot. Um, let me open it up to the panel just to comment a little further on how you've applied clinical decision support tools in ways that the big challenges I always see are it's really three barriers. You know, which patient may need genomics? Which test do we order? And then how do we interpret and integrate the resulting information into follow-on clinical care? And one of the complexities in genomics is it touches so many different areas of clinical care. For predisposition risk testing, often this is needing to be applied in a primary care setting, right? 
for specialty care. We've talked about oncology. We've talked a little bit about newborn, peds, right? But this is for cardiology, neurology. It really expands so many different clinical care areas. So um, James, Christine, would you like to comment a little further? Well, let on? me, I'm gonna tee this up for Christine. You know, we're, we're um, you know, if, if, you, if you think about total cancer care two, uh, 2.0, version two, we're moving towards an initiative in partnership with Invite. Um, Morehouse Cares, comprehensive approaches to reimagine health equity solutions. Uh, and in this, we're moving outside of the uh, cancer clinic to begin to identify patients at high risk of cancer for genetic tests, genetic screening. Um, and one of the, one of the a major barrier we've encountered um, is frankly the lack of these enterprise tools to help um, deciding how to navigate the requirements for te ordering tests. Um, so we're using some of these tools developed by Invite to help make our, uh, this precision medicine initiative possible. So. That's fantastic. You touched just a little bit about the equitable access to care. Exactly. And Francis had mentioned yesterday, I think he had said 2% of kind of global genomic databases actually oh. are representative you know, of a typically underrepresented community. Yeah. We know that this is a problem in genomic-based medicine. Yeah. And, there... Right, and you know, what's, what's interesting about that, if you, if you look at historically where those, these samples have been collected that are fueling precision medicine, they, they dance around a region in the United States, the southeastern region, the, the Black Belt, if you will. States with the highest population of African Americans that span South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. But a lot of the uh, registries uh, of this very rich data that we've been collecting for decades, you know, is, is out it's in Boston, it's here in California. So just the, the demographics, the population merits uh, initiative focus in the Black Belt, mm -hmm. um, which is why we're also excited by this uh, partnership. Can you comment at all on the patient experience side and whether or not you're finding any resistance or concerns as you're rolling out your total cancer care program? Right, well, initially, yes. We actually took a step back and began to have focus groups of patients, providers, nurses, uh, family members to get a better, understand, uh, better understanding of the fears or the perspectives that may be uh, fueling this distrust. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and what, what, what we identified, actually, when we addressed those fears, because they're quite real, real you know, it's, it's not made up. We all know some of the history of this country, obviously, and um, some of the bias we see in healthcare, the United States edu medical education system and the healthcare system. So addressing some of those issues was pretty straightforward. And what we found after mitigating those, um, also explaining the value and presenting a value proposition for the patient to become a participant in these studies, we found that we, we, we actually achieved greater than 90% accrual rates when enrolling compared to 10, 30% as that may have been reported by others. You know, it's fantastic. Th th there's, such a, um, there's such a misunderstanding sometimes amongst patients. Yep. I, I totally agree. And um, this really struck me when we rolled out our population scale whole genome project. You know, we've been enrolling thousands of patients every month, doing whole genome sequencing. And our participation rate is like 70% of people that we approach say, yeah, I want to participate, which is amazing. That we, is amazing. You know, yeah. We don't get that anywhere. And so we've been very happy. But then when we call them back, and we have you know, genetic counselors and the team and others that call back the patients and say, hey, uh, would you like to receive your results? And they've told us beforehand whether they want to receive a call or not. Mm. Only half of people want to know the results when we have found you know, a pathogenic yes. variant. And half are wow. saying, I don't want to know. So wow. we didn't foresee that. And what's interesting is we thought 2 to 3% of the population would have a pathogenic variant for which we'd have to call them back and say, you know, you have inherited an inherited cancer syndrome or cardiovascular risk, turns out almost 8% have a variant. So it's much higher than we thought. We're having to make far more phone calls, and that high of a percentage of people are saying, we don't want to know the results. So we've got some work to do. 
We've got some educating to do. And, it's, it's, and I think that the occasional reluctance we see on the physician side is reflected you know, in the general population. Mm -hmm. It's just this sort of um, you know, overall acceptance education that needs to happen. But it is, it is happening. I mean, we're okay. Like, you know, nine years ago when we first started having these kind of conversations, it was, we would brag that we had sequenced a cancer patient recently and found a targeted therapy, and now it's like standard of care. In fact, it's increasingly hard to justify amongst oncologists when you have not done comprehensive genomic profiling. There are just so many guidelines, you know, FDA approved biomarkers that it is happening much more than it ever has before, right? So agree. we are making progress. Yeah. We're making great progress. We're, we're making progress, and I'm gonna slaughter this quote a little bit, but Einstein said we can't use the same thinking to solve our problems as we used when we created them, ah. yeah. approximately. Yeah. Uh, and I think on the clinical decision support tool front, historically, we've tried to like layer clinical decision support tool in what was originally designed to help us bill, not to help us manage patients. And so we've popped in these binary alerts. And as Eric mentioned yesterday on the panel, there are more and more layers of omics that matter. It is not this single, hey, with this gene, do this one thing. It's layers and layers and layers of complexity. And we have tools that can actually, in real time, take all of this complexity and provide the latest evidence-based guidance on what a doctor should consider doing. We need to move beyond these binary alerts and actually leverage the technology infrastructure we have to provide real-time clinical decision support to really drive things forward. And I keep hearing, you know, education, clinical decision support, EHR integration for both patients and providers. I'm just gonna plug this because I can't help myself. There is an act of Congress right now called the Right Drug Dose Now Act mm -hmm. that would allocate funding to educate both patients and providers about the impact pharmacogenomics can have on reducing adverse drug events. It would provide sustained funding for CPIC and other evidence-based guidelines bodies that help advance pharmacogenomics. And it would call for a plan to update EHRs to not only scan for drug drug, but also drug gene and multi-factor interactions so that we can put this, make it easy for people to make the right decision. So if you want to learn more about that, fourthcause.org slash right act. Thank you. Well, bringing up the uh, kind of administrative or you know, regulatory function, I'd, I'd love to hear just maybe quickly from, uh, you know, what is the role? How at a federal level or state level, what are the barriers? How can we drive better adoption? How do we ultimately help genomics to scale? Anything else you would highlight from a regulatory perspective? Uh, I think the other thing that is a huge barrier, and we all know about it, uh, is reimbursement. Yeah. Frankly, there's not going to be equitable access to things yeah. until you don't have to have platinum insurance to get it or happen to be at an academic medical center. It needs to be accessible to everyone. So actually getting guidelines you know, that align with the evidence. I know the American Cancer Society has uh, pushed biomarker legislation. It's already passed in Louisiana, uh, Illinois, and I believe Rhode Island. And this actually mandates payer coverage for biomarker testing that aligns with the evidence and either national coverage or local coverage determinations. So that would include yep. pharmacogenomics. Mm -hmm. um, but this is something that needs to happen and people can help uh, move forward at the state level. You know, one, one of the great things we learned from the pandemic is that telemedicine works and that patients are willing to accept it and love it. And, uh, and in fact, often prefer it. And prefer it. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to get care close to home or in their home. Mm -hmm. And, and so that, you know, telemedicine is one way and all of the legislation around that, making sure that the, that gets paid for and reimbursed and all of that, that's how we can, you know, improve access and, uh, you know, hold the hand of the physician as they get their feet red, wet around this. I, you know, Lisa, your company's doing this, right? I mean, this is what Genome Medical is doing is, is breaking these barriers, getting access for patients and helping physicians understand the impact of that genetic testing because nothing's worse than getting a report back that has something on it, a gene, a variant, or whatever, that that provider doesn't understand, and they feel dumb, and they'll never order it again if they feel dumb, right? So um, that, th this kind of uh, you know, effort is, is going to make a difference, is making a difference. Well, I think that's such an important point. There's a whole ecosystem that's evolved. So if you're a clinician or you know, hospital administrator, you do not need to build this from scratch, yeah. right? We have now the players to help support with clinical decision support tools, ready on-demand telehealth access to specialists, labs that can help support and stand up programs. It is now much more attainable. It's 
it's less of let's sit down and figure it out from scratch. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of the building blocks and foundational layers in place. And it's not a big investment. You don't have to you know, come up with 10 or 15 or $20 million to get it started. It can all just start. All right, so we're going to enter a very quick lightning round, and let's keep it lightning <laughs> for yesterday's No discussion. Obama? No Obama, yes. <laughs> so um, I will, James, I'll start with you. Uh, what do you see is most exciting on the horizon kind of over the next 10 years in the field of genomics? Right. So I'll just look next year when we're up and running. Our Morehouse Cares initiative is up and running with Invite. We would have um, started um, a graduate certificate program for community oncologists to learn more about genomic medicine. Uh, we will have uh, started a master's in precision medicine and data science at Morehouse School of Medicine, a master's of genetic counseling. Um, gosh, would you imagine there are only 46 out of 6,000 genetic counselors uh, that are African American? You know, we want to we want to change that. Um, we want to see how precision medicine, um, uh, genomic medicine, I should say, affects uh, and, and, and improves our clinical workflow at Morehouse Healthcare. And as we scale, you know, we, I was working with uh, maybe a handful of community oncology practices in the area, and as we scale to 10,000 annual analytic cases, new cancer cases across the South. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with Invite to make that a reality and getting those results back to them. Excellent. Christine, what are you most excited about for the future? Well, I, I'm going to be uh, obvious and say I'm most excited that in the future a patient, whether they're at their doctor's office or pharmacy, will have an interrupt if they're about to get a prescription that could cause them harm, uh, kill them, not work for them. Uh, and an easy one-click alternative that fixes the problem. I don't think we're very far away from that. We have the technology now. Excellent. Carla, what's your excitement for the future? Yeah, so for me, it's AI and machine learning on top of genomics um, and with layers of multiomics on top of that. Uh, so I think genomics is going to be the backbone for, for medicine, is the backbone for medicine, but it's not going to be enough, right? Um, uh, there's way more uh, that needs to happen. And uh, I don't think, uh, and I think we need tools like AI and machine learning to, to enable us to deal with the complexity. It's going to be enabled for humans to do alone, right? Because it's, it's so rich. Uh, and so, so I, I think that's what we're going to see in the future, and we see it everywhere already. AI and machine learning are infiltrating our lives continuously in, in, in funny little ways. I think they're going to infiltrate medicine dramatically in the coming years, and uh, you know, in 10 years, I think it's going to be a very different spiel uh, than the one we experience currently. Yeah. I like that yeah. vision. Lincoln, what's your? Well, I, I love what multi-cancer early detection liquid biopsy is doing. It's going to transform oncology. I'm very excited about that. But I just have to say, that somebody, some health system is going to be the first one that says, we are just going to sequence everyone from birth. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that's, I think that's going to happen. I want to see who it's going to be. We've actually even had conversations at Intermountain about just doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, imagine you go to your new patient visit, and they're like, have you, you, know, have you been genome mapped? No? Right. OK. Right. That's part of your you know, standard lipid panel and everything else. So let's just map your genome. That, mm. We've got to do that. That is the future. That is where we're headed. I'm going to open it up for audience Q&A, but before I do so, I also just want to comment for myself. I really see us entering a genomics first approach where it's fully integrated into both primary care and specialty care. I would share the enthusiasm for precision oncology. That full journey from predisposition risk screening, finding patients at an elevated risk where they need a change in their screening protocol, uh, to multi-cancer early detection, to tumor profiling to identify oncogenic drivers and better determine selection of treatment, to companion diagnostics, to minimal residual disease monitoring, to measure for persistence uh, or recurrence. It's going to change the face of oncology care, and it is here now. So very exciting. Mm -hmm.